Hello, sir. Hey. How are you? Oh, oh Zoom. <laughs> How you been? Good. You feeling better? Yes. If you look, if you bounce. <laughs> yeah, <we're> right. <laughs> How it's, you been? it's great. Like there's, there, there's the stress and anger diet, which is great because you don't eat, uh, you know, the, the sick or I guess the feeling poorly diet. I, I was in the hospital years ago. My appendix burst. I lost like 11 pounds in three weeks. Um, not in a good way, but, you know. It helps. It, yeah. Yeah. So we saw a really nice paper and we commented on Facebook. Um, I, I, I just and that's why I. I you know, when we had that uh, email exchange, when that constraint, yeah, the constraint total energy expenditure, you know, the, what it says, model uh, that progressive increases. In, <laughs> yeah, it increases in physical activity that leads to increase in total energy expenditure. But it says that after certain physical activity threshold, the T plateaus. And the right. whole thing is that the compensatory reduction, the expenditure is non-essential, non-essential activities contains this kind of total energy expenditure model. Right. What's, what's, so, the, what's the hypothesis like? Are we? So, so I think there's a couple things going on. So for people so that they have background, right? So this all comes from a guy named researcher named Herman Ponser. And the first paper I read by him was actually back in 2015. And he was doing some stuff before then. And I think we should talk briefly about that Hadza, the hunter-gatherer study, because I think that ties into this. With, right. with the Hadza or the Hadza or? Yeah, yeah. Um, which he did in 2012. So I think like some of his early uh, individual studies led him to this model, right? So the basic idea is the model we've always kind of assumed is as you add activity, energy expenditure goes up and up and up, right? It's an additive model. That the more you do, the more you burn. Now, even before we read Ponzer's work, we knew that that wasn't quite right. What Ponzer has argued is that energy expenditure is constrained, is that, like you said, up to a point, adding activity will cause total energy expenditure to go up. But at mm -hmm. some point, there will be adaptations to basically constrain energy expenditure. Right, and he argues, and this is in a 2015 paper, I think the first one he, he wrote, called Constrained Total Energy Expenditure and the Evolutionary Biology of Energy Balance, that it would be adaptive, right, for the body to have these constraints in place that will eventually try to, and we know this, we know that from dieting, right? I've been writing about metabolic adaptations to dieting since, we'll good see. God almighty, almost two decades, right? We know the body is trying to prevent you from starving to death. So but is that through not getting in that position of not moving or being more sluggish? Well, and that's, and that's the question is where the adaptation is occurring. And we'll sort of come, I, I want to come back to that because there's a couple different places that it might be occurring. Now, where a lot of this started, right? He did this paper in 2012, Hunter-Gatherer Energetics and Human Obesity, PLOS 1, 2012. And it's funny, somebody, I, maybe it was you, asked me about this paper. So what he did is he looked at one of those hunter-gatherer tribes, the Hadza, and versus a Western group of sedentary individuals. And he used doubly labeled water, which we know is very accurate. And what he found was that their total daily energy expenditure was identical. Now, somebody mentioned that to me in a podcast, and I was like, I don't believe it. And I got called out on that, and I went back and looked at the paper and said, okay, that's what the study found. I believe it. I don't think it's for the reasons that he says it is, right? And so it was a different BMI, no, then, what's that? It was different in BMI, no? Well, and that's what it came down to, right? Like, I'm like, okay, great. I think it was a happy coincidence to a degree. <laughs> and so he found that they had the same, but what, what was kind of left out was the Western individuals were 66 pounds heavier than these lean Hadza individuals with nine and 12% more body fat, respectively, for women and men. Six, 33 kilos heavier, okay, let me, 33 kilos, so, and what I did is super long write up in my Facebook group, and what I pointed out was, right, total daily energy expenditure, basal metabolic rate, mostly related to body size, thermic effect of food, meh, exercise, 
like physical activity, like formal exercise, which realistically neither group was doing particularly much of, right? I don't believe the heads that go jogging. And then neat, right? Spontaneous activity, non-exercise activity. The and what can happen is you can get to the same value different ways. Yeah. Because what its whole point was the Hadza have like two hours of daily activity per day. And the Westerners have very little. What the what? 33 kilos heavier, right? So what you had is that the heavier Westerners had a much higher basal metabolic rate and lower activity. And the Hadza had a much lower metabolic and a much higher activity. And my point was if the Hadza were 33 kilos heavier, with the same activity, their energy expenditure would have been staggeringly higher. And if the Westerners at 33 kilos heavier and had the same activity as the Hadza, to me, you know what this constraint was? They were lighter. The constraint is they were lighter. Their body weight was lower, right? And as an example, right? So I train a female powerlifter, Sumi Singh. She weighs, she competes at 114. She usually trains about 117. She gets 20,000 plus steps a day. She, it's ridiculous, right? Her maintenance is something like 22 calories per pound, like 40 some odd kcals per kilo, something stupid. I'm willing, now I weigh like 180 pounds and I sit in front of the computer all day. Her and my maintenance are probably about the same. The difference is I get there by being heavier and doing jack squat all day. She gets there by being, and I think there's so, because if we'd taken these Westerners and had them do the same amount of activity, yeah, they would eventually come back down by losing weight. So, I think, so that's to me, okay. So he used that to develop this constraint. And let me make it clear for listeners. There are obviously constraints in place. There are obviously adaptations that occur. I don't want anybody to hear me saying that they're not. It's the way Ponzer is presenting it that you and I both have a problem with it. And it's yeah, also yeah. an issue is the way he's being interpreted by pop science, but that's, that's not his fault. Although his book burn, did you read it? I, I started and then I couldn't go any further. If that makes as sense. soon as I saw the, the subtitle that was blows the lid off, I'm like, I'm done. I'm not even going to bother because it's just going to make me angry. All right. So he wrote this paper, right? 2015 presents the model. Now he presents a lot of animal models. Now, A, I don't care about animal models. I just don't. Either way, whether they, whether they agree with me or not, I don't care until it. And what he found is what, what the studies find is that, yes, as physical activity goes up, total energy expenditure typically goes down. Yeah, so but it's based thing. again on the heads up. With, but with one exception, which are in starlings of all things. And yay, this one little migratory bird, all the animals lose substantial body mass because what's happening and where you're in my one of my pro is this is coming across as oh exercise won't raise energy expenditure make you lose weight because the body will will just constrain it but that's the constraint right so there's the animal he mentions the animal that has the study now he brings up a couple of exceptions one are substance substance subs subsistence farmers right? People that have to farm to survive. They have a higher total energy expenditure, even after controlling for body size, right? So obviously they're an exception to this constrained model. He brings up high level athletes like Tour de France cyclists, suggests that there may be, that they also, same thing. Now he, he comes up with some stuff. He says, well, there might be a, a total energy expenditure set point that maybe it's higher in these people. How do you set that point? Well, he's saying, to me, this is a hand wave. To me, this is a, well, there may be a set point somewhere in the system, but they just gravitate towards higher activities genetically. Then with the cyclist, he goes, well, maybe the drugs they take prevent. And at this point, I'm just like, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, just stop. Because <laughs> he wrote... He wrote, similarly, the remarkably high total energy expenditure reported for some athletes during training may reflect the exceptionally high workloads and food availability during their adolescence. Basically, he's saying that since they did all this training and ate so much when they were younger, but no, here's the constraint. The constraint is their sport. If your sport requires you to ride six hours a day, you ride six hours a day. If your life requires you to work on the farm eight hours a day, there isn't a hell of a lot of time 
for the body to constrain, right? There's a guy in my Facebook group several years ago we were talking about overweight individuals. I was like, look, when you're heavier, activity is often very difficult because you're so heavy. And he said, well, I had this job when I was in high school and I was forced to be on my feet and walk around eight hours a day and I lost a lot of weight. I go, and it was your job. You didn't have a choice. That was the constraint. So I don't, and, and I think in that regards, okay. And at this point, I don't think he had a mechanism proposed. We'll come back to that. But one thing I, let's say for the time being, one of the very proposed mechanisms is that if, when you add exercise, you move around less with yeah. meat. And there is certainly data to support that. There's also data that doesn't support that. There's data that shows that exercise raises meat. So we'll come back to that. But I think here we get into conscious versus unconscious stuff, right? It's like, okay, we know this is true with appetite. Frequently people, one of the adaptations or constraints to losing weight with activity is people eat more. And we can't ever forget that one because in a lot of studies, food intake is not control. And the reason people aren't losing weight, because we're assuming, right? Because you go, all right, they added 300 calories a day of exercise. They should lose X weight based on math. And they didn't. Well, there must be a constraint. Yeah, and frequently they just eat more. You know what my problem is on that? No one checks the hypothalamus. In what do you mean in terms of what's going on neurochemically? Yeah, neurochemically, because we we're seeing it from that perspective. But then if, 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 if you want to throw that, that addition or that sure. constraint, I could say the same thing. And I would say, OK, what about neuropeptide Y and see what's going on? Well, yeah, but I mean, but there are, I mean, basically, they just do free feeding studies. And some of them find that, it, you know, looking at actual real world food intake. Um, but I think there's a conscious versus unconscious thing. So yeah, let's say you add exercise and in some people neat goes down. And again, we'll look at, I got seven pages of notes on this. There's data, there's actually data on this, but what is the big thing in physique competition in physique prep right now, using activity trackers, using step counters and going, look, when you're deep into prep, when your body is trying to make you constrain your activity, your energy expenditure, make sure that you consciously maintain your step count. So yeah, in the average person, you put them through a hard workout and they lay around the rest of the day unconsciously. Yeah, there's a, that's, and that's a difference. Now, one thing he also brings up somewhere, uh, let's see. Oh, I wanna come back to something he said that it's so dumb, it hurts that it just, uh, and this is, he's entering my, he's talking about low energy availability. And at this point, like, okay, dude, you don't need, you know what you're talking about. And one thing he said, realize, he's not saying that there is an adaptation at any level, even his little curve. But he said, the constrained model suggests that total energy expenditure increases within a low range of physical activity, but the effect diminishes at higher levels, right? And the curve he shows, right? So here's, here's total daily energy expenditure is that you add activity and it goes up. And as you add more, it flattens out. And you actually wrote something on Sumi's wall. Somebody posted the burn and that I think is worth you. You said something in terms of what you'd found in terms of there being a sweet spot that yeah. I think is worth you expanding on before I, I <laughs> go off on a rant about what he wrote about energy availability. So. No, the, and you know what? That, that's one I sent you about uh, when, uh... Kevin Hall said, I don't think the constrained energy expenditure model has been tested under weight loss conditions, but Pancho can correct me. Regardless, it is difficult to uh, substantially augment diet-induced weight loss with moderate doses of physical activity, high doses maybe. Right, yeah, and there's actually, and I'll, I'll look at some research on that as well. Um, there is a, a Wisconsin study that I actually cited two of them in, in the women's book that talked about this. But one thing, what you had written on Sumi's wall is that you found like there's the sweet spot. Right? Yeah. And there's no doubt, and there is research on this. If I take a beginner, there's one study I remember, and they took untrained beginners, they gave me the 300, day, 300 calories per day of activity or 600. And they found the weight loss, the end of it was the same. And presumably, neat. There was a compensation in the hot, like, and fine, if I take a beginner and put them through an hour of hard exercise, they're going to be tired, which just to me doesn't, all that says is, well, if 300 to 600 gets you the same weight loss, do the 300. But what if there's also an intensity thing, 
Yeah. Everyone likes to rattle on about high interval, about interval training. And guess what makes you exhausted if you do it right? And trust me, I've done, I was an endurance athlete for two decades. I've done more interval workouts than I care to think about. Because if you're doing them right, they're not fun. Every paper I read, oh, people enjoyed the interval training workouts more than they didn't do them right. It's a fucking dark trust place. Me, it, yes, it is. It is a dark place to go if you really push yourself hard. And yeah, whereas... 30 minutes of brisk walking will not tire you out right so it depends you're looking at fitness you're looking at intensity something there's so many variables lyle on that right but and again poncer has a tendency and this is another reason whenever i see this some of the studies he cites when you go look at the actual papers and what he's representing them as there's a later paper i'll come back to and he cites four papers showing that there is a compensation Three of them are in postmenopausal women. Okay, so we're looking at older women with huge hormonal variations going on, thrown into God knows, yeah, I'm stunned that a 50-year-old woman is getting tired from exercise. What does this have to do with the rest of anything? Not dismissing it as a model, dismissing it as a generalizable example. What about their fitness level? What if you build them into it over six months so that they're not getting tired? All right, so he then writes... Because right, so at this point, he wasn't really proposing a mechanism. That would come later. <laughs> he, he writes, at higher exercise work, because, well, so one thing you did talk about is that the body will decrease metabolic activity of internal organs and systems, mm -hmm. right? This is another, the BMR would go down. We're going to talk about that recent paper, the one that makes me want to just scream that came out about six weeks ago. He wrote, at higher exercise workloads, the constrained model predicts that exercise can have detrimental health effects as the energy available for critical non-physical activity, metabolic activity is reduced. He's saying that too much exercise can be bad for you. Now, now you're, in my, now you're in my house. Okay. Energy availability, women's menstrual cycle function, hypogonadism. In a sense, what energy availability represents is calorie intake minus exercise activity energy expenditure right and if that gets too low the body doesn't have enough energy to run everything so it has to slow stuff down women will lose menstrual cycle function immune system goes down et cetera et cetera et cetera hair and hair and nails stop growing that has nothing to do with high levels of activity per se because energy availability is energy intake Minus, if you're matching your exercise level with enough calories, that doesn't happen. And this is another thing he seems to be conflating, is exercise per se, calorie restriction per se, weight loss per se, per se, and the combination of all three. He seems to be sort of conflating, well, it's just the exercise, uh-uh. So there's that. He also does mention something that I think is worth considering. There's several meta-analyses or earlier papers that looked at this. A lot of them find that you don't see the compensation for about 20 weeks. So it's not like it's immediate anyway. Well, what's happened by the time someone has increased physical activity for 20 weeks? They've lost fat. They're smaller. They're burning less calories in activity because they're smaller. It's not the, he's making it sound like as soon as you increase activity, you will get constrained and it will fight back. Uh, then you see research, uh, uh, you see papers that he has, you know, split it between women and men. You cannot put that in. Yeah, yeah, kind of, I mean, you sort of have to, there are differences in how women's and men's bodies adapt, unless you're saying what you're saying, a misunderstanding. No, exactly. First, but second of all, you're talking oh, oh, yeah. You know, different and also different BMI. You're talking about different kind of uh, the, the, the variables in their activity, what they're going to lose, if they're going to lose. Sure. Um, and there are other issues that other researchers have brought up. Again, this is later in my notes. One of the things he also does say in this, that the limits of adaptation are unclear, right? It says there is some lower limit. To, once some lower limit to non-physical activity is reached, right? So let's assume it's coming from a drop in meat. Right, let's just assume that for now. What if your need's zero? What if you're me? <laughs> I, 
my knee, I go load Simeus plates and I sit, literally I sit on my butt the rest of the day. If I had exercise, if knee's already zero, it can't go down. There's probably a limit to how much knee, and, and even like look at, look at road cyclists, look at endurance athletes. How much knee do they have? They're on the bike six to eight hours a day. During the Tour de France, they may be riding eight hours a day. They're sleeping eight hours a day. Who gives a crap what happens? The other time they're just eating, <laughs> trying to recover. Right now, if you've got someone who goes and does 45 minutes of exercise, maybe they see a drop, but again, too many variables. How fit are they? What did they do? What intensity? How much are they eating? What's their deficit? Is there a deficit? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whether, but maybe, let's say neat can come down, just make them a number by 200 calories, just okay. because, mm -hmm. right? So do 300 calories of exercise, no adaptation. And again, this is purely hypothetical. Now you do 600. Neat comes down by 200. All right, well, you did twice the work to get 100 calories extra. What if you go to 900? If knee can't go down anymore, guess what? You just got another, you just got another 300. Now you're still burning 900 for a net 700, but you're still burning more. So even he, so a lot of this in 2015 was very sort of very, very, very hypothetical model. Now there is one paper he cites, and I like this paper because it has been cited so badly in so many different ways by so many different people. I read this paper, it's one of my favorite papers that it shows you how not to cite, a, how, how not to read a paper. Okay, this is a 1991 paper by Westerterp et al, Long-Term Effects of Physical Activity on Energy Balance and Body Composition. All right, they took 16 women and 16 men, they trained for a half marathon over 40 weeks. Here's how it is typically cited. It is typically cited as evidence that men lose weight from exercise and women don't. In half a marathon. In training for a half marathon. Yeah. That they lose, okay, body weight. I'm being very specific here. Over the course of the study, the men lost two kilos of body weight. The women lost one, and it just happened to be statistically significant. One kilo difference, but this gets cited all the time. Ah, women don't lose weight with exercise, men do, is one kilo difference. Now, when you look at the body composition, the men gained 2.8 kilos of fat-free mass and lost 1.8 kilos of fat. The women gained 3.2 kilos of fat-free mass and lost an identical amount of body fat. Who get it? So the actual results <laughs> are that they lost an identical amount of body fat. So I've seen it cited that way now. Um, the way Ponser cites this paper is that, oh, over this training study, and I even had to dig back like two papers to see what the actual training was, because that's just me being me. I want to know exact, and, and there's just this weird stair-stepped volume over 40 weeks. I couldn't, I looked at it and could, didn't care. Mm -hmm. And he, well, it's just like, so there's a progressive increase in volume from 50 to 250 kilometers per week but it, daily, weekly, it was changing. It's really hard to tell what they did. Typical, they went from like yeah. 10 to 30 minutes at the beginning to like up to 90 minutes by week 40. And so the way he cited it is that, oh, there was a decrease in sleeping metabolic rate at week 20. You might've seen me bitch about this before. Now. <laughs> That's what I'm laughing. <laughs> so sleeping metabolic rate is exactly what it sounds like right? It's the most basal metabolic rate there is, is what you burn over the eight hours of sleep. Now, by week 40, sleeping metabolic rate was reduced in men only by 47 calories. Okay. Here's what he left out when he cites this paper. Total daily energy expenditure in the men was up by about 660 calories. In the women, there was no decrease in sleeping metabolic rate. And their daily calorie expenditure was up by 400. So all he focused on was the 50 calorie drop. I don't like it when this, this is ideology now because yay, sleeping metabolic rate went down by 50, but their total daily energy expenditure went up by four to 600. Why? Again, it's the same thing with the BMI as we started with the Hadza. Well, yeah. And they were also, they were also, also appetite started to go up in week 20 which was the other part of the reason that weight loss 
But like I said, they still lost, you know. Again, anyway. when you said it went up, the appetite, we don't know in which phase of their cycle. We're doing like 250. Yeah. Or... Okay. So, so, so like I said, he, that paper gets cited a lot and everybody, it's clear that they didn't read. Well, Ponser is clearly picking out the one little piece of data that supports his model, but ignoring the bigger picture. I don't care that. And another paper actually gave double those numbers. I think they remapped it or somehow. So like, I'll say metabolic rate went down by a hundred in men, but they, they cited the total daily energy expenditures up by like 1200. And realize that's hundred calories over eight hours. Like, yay, yip de doo um, Okay, so there was a commentary on the 2015 paper by Raviusen and Peterson, physical activity and the missing calories. Uh, he, they, they state typically we assume, typically it's assumed that the missing calories are due to increased food intake. That's mm -hmm. an assumption. Food intake is very hard to measure in the real world. You're using food recalls. Food recalls suck. <laughs> <laughs> because they state that Ponzer argues that decreases are due to basal metabolic rate or NEAT. Okay. He says, however, they write, moreover, as Ponzer admits, athletes and subsistence farmers present a clear challenge because they exceed the proposed limits. And then they write, same thing I said, even in the case of the Hadza of comparable energy expenditure, once adjusted for fat free, uh, therefore, despite a possible upper limit on energy expenditure, physical activity can reduce adiposity. They were 33 kilos lighter. How is this a bad thing? <laughs> like, if I were to tell you that by the time you've lost 33 kilos, your energy expenditure will have gone down, will that bother you? Will that bother anybody listening to this? Probably not. Okay. So then we get to 2018, Ponzer Energy Constraint, a novel mechanism linking exercise, health, and physiology. This is the one where he cites like, um, he goes, in controlled exercise intervention studies, human subjects often exhibit a much smaller increase in total energy expenditure than expected. Cites four studies, three of them, one in elderly, one in postmenopausal, one in older women. Yeah. What is that? Like? Huh? Yeah, I mean, and that's fine. And I wouldn't expect anything different because if you throw an older person into activity, they're gonna be tired. Then he cites something called the Midwest Exercise Trial. And there's actually, I put these in, cause they, they were one of the papers that looked at men's and women's, the differences in weight loss. And they mentioned a few things. They go, why is weight loss so disappointing in most exercise studies? And said, one, the amount given is irrelevant. Oh, we had them exercise 30 minutes, three times a week. Hooray. It's 900 calories a week if you're lucky. They go, B, it's unsupervised. And the reality is when people aren't supervised, they, they dork around in their, if they do it at all. And what, so what they did is they took beginners, women and men, and they started them at 100 calories six days a week. And over six months, they raised as they got fitter. So by the end of it, they were burning 600 calories six days a week. They also said it relative to calories. That here's the other problem, especially between women and men. We take two women and a man who way different, different BMI, different body fat. So they do 30 minutes at 75% of maximum heart rate. The women burn less calories. Of course they lose less weight. Let's see, we so go they again. Did, they said it relative to calories. And what happened was the women had to exercise like 15% more to burn the same amount. But when they, when they equated the calorie expenditure, women and men lost the same amount. The women simply had to do more. Anyway, but that paper found that in the exercise, about 50% were responders and 50% were non-responders that did not see. Okay, now, number one, what does this tell us? Even Ponser's model may only apply half the time. Maybe there is a biology to it. There probably is. Who knows what the variables were? When what he found was that the non-responders, the male non-responders, their calorie intake went up by about 200, whereas in the responders, it went down by 200. They found it was an energy intake. They found that non-exercise energy expenditure decreased in the non-responders. So there was a decrease in meat, whereas non-exercise physical activity, hang on, and RMR went down by 100 calories, but they lost fat. I mean, of course they did. The point of this being that one of the four papers he cites in support of his constrained model found it was only in about half of everybody. Yeah. In the men, it was due to eating more. 
There was, yeah, but there were, there were some small changes in need and okay, fine. Maybe there's some individual variants, but I don't see it being presented like that to say that maybe in half of everybody um, and somewhere I lost that note, but it was something to the effect of maybe we need to figure out who are the people that are going to be non-responders? Who are the people that are going to see an unconscious decrease? Maybe we need to counsel them, like the physique athletes. Go look. Even though you're exercising, you need to make sure that the rest of your daily activity doesn't change. Doesn't mm -hmm. have to go up. That it, so it's looking like maybe that's it. Maybe we need to identify. Maybe the problem is not that they're not responding, but we need to identify who they might be ahead of time so that we can counsel them of, look, this may happen. You need to be aware of it. So that was one. Then he cites, he writes, similarly, weight loss and exercise interventions is often less than predicted from exercise workload, suggesting a smaller increase in total energy expenditure than expected. Again, postmenopausal women. Here we um, go again. Again, he cites energy, another paper by Flack, energy compensation response to aerobic training. They did 300 versus 600 calories per day. But, but here, the 600 calorie per day lost fats, while the 300 calorie per day did not. So that's the opposite of his model. But there was a huge variation, it was 943 versus 1,000 calorie per day compensation. But it was like in one group, in the 600 calorie per day, the, the, the compensation was negative 164. Their activity went up to 2050 down. The, the variation is just, it's staggering. My problem is, first of all, the, the, the length of the, the, most of the designs. The other part that I've got a problem with is the limitations of the absence of the resting metabolic rate measurement. Right. Which is an important fact. The thermic effect of food, the accelerometers that they're yes, using. which are terrible. <laughs> which are horrible, yeah. yeah. And then um, the, 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 the cross-sectional design of, of certain papers. Sure. So actually the FLAC study found no change in resting energy expenditure. So that wasn't it. It was, there was a change in something going on. Total fat loss, 0.9 kilos versus, I mean, 2.6 kilos in 12 weeks in the 600 calorie per day group. So maybe it wasn't, but also we have this problem that again, some researchers brought up later. We are estimating what the fat loss should be. Maybe this, this could, and these are based on, yes, they're fairly standard calculations of, yeah, 3,500 calories per pound of fat, but it's 75% fat, 25% muscle. But we've got this weird double whammy. We're like, all right, well, we're calculating how much fat we think they should lose. So if they're not losing that much, we're going to assume there was a compensation that we're then going to estimate based on an estimation of, it's like, we have a problem here. We have a circular problem here. And I realize there's no solution to that at this point. Now that paper cites another one, Rosen killed body fat. Well, again, I was so deep in this this day I did this. Uh, body fat loss, compensatory mechanisms in response to different doses of aerobic exercise. Again, 300, 600 calories per day. They lost four kilograms in 12 weeks. But here's the thing. the In the 300 calorie per day group, there's the 20% compensation to 600 calorie per day group. So they, they burned 20% less. In the 300 calorie per day group, they lost more fat than predicted. They had a negative 83% compensation. There was a 37% increase in NEAT in the 300 calorie per day group. And he, but of course he cites this as if it supports him. And yet you actually look at, you know, you start to dig through the references, you're like, but, but it went up, but actually they burned more than predicted. Where's and the they wrote, there? Accordingly, the moderate dose of exercise results in a negative accumulated energy balance considerably in excess of what could be expected from the accumulated exercise energy expenditure. He cites Melanson, 2014 paper. This is like a review paper who write 2014 and they write, it appears that older adults are more likely to exhibit compensatory changes in NEAT. Yeah, you get tired when you're old. I'm 51, I'm old and I get tired, right? And in non, although none of these studies compared younger to older adults, we need that data. Moreover, since a variety of exercise intensities were employed, it's not possible to determine the independent effect of age and exercise intensity. Recent study in overweight adults suggests that reductions in eat were dose dependent with reductions only occurring at 600 calories per day, but not in the 300, which does support his model that above a point there is a compensation. Then he talk about, we're estimating, we're calculating fat loss, the ratios of loss. It's just kind of 
we're guessing at what we're saying. This is how much they should lose. And since they didn't, we're assuming there's a compensation, but we're not measuring it to your point. We're not measuring it. We're not measuring BMR. We're assuming there's a change based on not matching a theoretical calculation. And that's where everything is the flaw. So another really good review, this is that he cites 2015 references, predictors of energy compensation during exercise interventions. They looked at 71 studies. Mean energy compensation was 18% plus or minus 93%. Some people saw an increase of 80%. Other people saw a drop of, look, this is being represented as if you exercise, your body will burn less calories, plus or minus 48% of variance explained by initial fat mass, age, and duration. Mm -hmm. Shorter, and there was in shorter, so shorter study duration, lower compensation in the younger and the fatter individuals, which again makes sense. If you're younger, you don't get tired as much. You're carrying more body fat, the body doesn't fight back as hard. More of an adaptation for younger with less initial fat mass. I've been writing about this for decades. <laughs> the leaner you are, the earlier your body fights back. No shit. But from 25 weeks on, there was no longer a difference for these predictors. Basically, once you get that to 20, 25 weeks, well, that's because everybody's lost fat. The compensation range was from negative to, I think I looked through the individual studies, negative 254% to 125%. So some people burned 250% more than predicted. I want to see what the measure and how. And over the long term, it was 84%. No, these were measured, I think. And again, no mechanistic data. They speculated maybe it was neat that might, be, might decrease over time or it might increase due to fitness improvements. People who are heavier who lose weight are often more active during the day because it's easier to move around. We are making a lot of assumptions on this. So finally, he cites Thomas. 2012, why do individuals not lose more weight from exercise intervention? It says, increase, could be increased food intake, could be reductions in resting energy expenditure, increases in lean tissue, right? We're looking at body weight, like that Westerterp study. If people gain three pounds of muscle while they lose three pounds of fat, and it could be a decrease in need. But here's one of the things they mentioned specifically, that resting metabolic rate does not change as long as body weight is maintained. Ponser is conflating weight and fat loss, he's assuming a decrease and adaptive decrease in RMR. No, it only occurs when you lose fat. And then of course the adaptive component. All right, this was, all right, so this brings us, well, before we move on to the most recent paper that made me want to rip my hair out. That's why I send it over any, to you. <laughs> yeah, any more comments on this? Any more thoughts on what we just talked about that we didn't cover? No, you know, it, it's exactly what we talked about before. Um, I think it's a lack uh, of actual measurements and the mechanistic part of missing out specifics that actually are skewing with the uh, data. Now, now I have going back to the, like I said, I think he's conflating, I said exercise alone, which is his focus, to diet. Because I do have some papers, again, I cited in the women's book, when they've looked at exercise or dieting does tend to decrease need, absolutely. Cal reduced calorie intake. And I, although it varies hugely, there was one study, it was done at like three different hospitals and the variance and the decrease in need is enormous. Yeah, but- But again, that's dieting. That's not the same diet, as going- It's not about physical, physical activity, activity and measure and, and uh, actually saying that more physical activity actually brings, that uh, creates adaptation that has no right. effect. Yeah, I mean, it, again, there could be a compensation. And yeah, if you do a ton of exercise, if you burn, you might move around less. There's no doubt about that. And I won't disagree with that. But again, if you work up to it, your fitness is high. If you consciously try to keep that from occurring. So like I said, again, for people listening to this, I don't disagree that there can be a compensation, obviously. What I disagree with is I think Ponser's entire model and the way he's presenting it and the data he's citing, because he's confusing activity per se, the mechanisms, he's assuming this is the case. Yeah, the amount goes down if you lose weight. Meat goes down in some people. What would you change? What hmm? would you change and what you know, kind of data would you want to see in order to convince yourself? Well, I mean, I, think, well, I mean, A, you, what you need, I mean, I guess it depends on what we're talking about. Are we, is he, is he even looking necessarily at weight loss? I mean, like, is this specific model talking about why exercise 
I've never been quite exactly sure like what he's even trying to to argue. From my point of view, what's coming out that uh, don't exercise more, it's not doing anything. Right, and I don't necessarily, but like to your point, so again, this is what you wrote on Sumi's wall, and I probably should have pasted this, which was that there's a sweet spot where like the, the whoever wrote you back that said, realistically, small amounts of exercise do jack crap for weight loss. We know this factually. Now, no, do I think that just doing more activity, there's going to be a linear change? Not necessarily. But a lot of that is, well, what are you doing the rest of the day? How did you get there? If I take a beginner and I throw them into 600 calories of hard exercise on day one. Yeah, I'm sure they're going to move around less. But that's just because I'm a bad coach. That has nothing to do with exercise per se, because their fitness is not high enough to make that worthwhile. And the studies have shown that. We gave people 300, 600 day one. Yeah, the 600 calorie per day people were more tired. Okay, cool. What if we ramp them up like the one study did that took six months to get to 600 calories? What about the data showing that in the early stages, they may negatively compensate and be more active because they I mean, how many people are like, ah, I had more energy when I started exercising, right? Because you didn't murder yourself. Yeah, but then again, you cannot put in a novice like that starts now because he has so many more adaptations to catch up rather than a person that has been training for 20 years that it's not going to be the same. Sure. And I don't know that he's you know, necessarily talking, you know, he does, he sort of, it's funny how he kind of like, well, elite athletes overwhelm this, but we're going to hand wave why they can get away with it. Like, yeah, that's a little bit of a, maybe it's the drugs. No, maybe it's because when you have to train that much, you don't have a choice and your needs already pretty low. What do athletes do? Train, eat, rest, and sleep. And that's it. And inject EPO. That's what endurance athletes do. <laughs> that doesn't take a lot of energy though. And that does never come out of the system, right? So it's not like their need is high anyway, because they're saving as much energy as they can for the six hours they got to spend on the bike. And it is probably additive under those conditions because it, but the constraint, the constraint is the requirement of the sport. Now, yeah. So in, in one of the papers, he talked about the Tour de France. Tour de France has like the highest energy expenditures of any activity. You see like 9,000 calories a day on some of the double stages. And is that sustainable? No, because I've looked at other work that talks about like, what is the maximal sustainable like energy expenditure? Like if you look like, you, and it's, it's something crazy. It's like 55 calories per kilo. It's some, I mean, it's an absurd number. Is that sustainable year round? No, but is that, we're comparing extremes now. We're saying that, oh, anything over 300 calories, the body's going to, compensate and you're going to waste your time doing more or you got to do 9,000 calories a day to overcome it like no you build up grat and and that's what I, I think we would need to see is and the controls would be impossibly hard you can't assume that there's an adaptation where it may not be there's no way there's so many variables it has to be measured and especially when they measure bmr and it's like didn't go down unless they lost weight so that's not that's a non-starter because he seems to be suggesting this occurs to prevent weight loss. That's my. That's exactly question. it. That's Especially with his book, his dumb book, which I refuse to read because I'll just get mad at it. I've seen too much of it. He, he's one of those scientists that got, I'm sure a pop side book editor punched that up for him. But as soon as I see that kind of blows the lid off of how the body really burns. Didn't, didn't somebody said he cited metabolic damage as a thing and, I'm done. I'm checked out. The biggest loser study, the one paper that goes against 50 decades, like I'm out. As soon as I see that, I'm out. And so, yeah, what you would have to do is take people, measure total daily energy expenditure at the very least, try to measure need. And that's real tough. I mean, step how counter. Would you, how would you measure need? Is the same thing when I say about diet and questionnaires? Well, diet questionnaires are absolute garbage. And that's always a problem with, they usually measure NEAT. They use like triaxial accelerometers, step, they looking at step counts. There, there's ways to do it. And I haven't, I can't say I've looked into it enough to know how accurate they are, but you can get at least a rough, rough idea. Because um, for, exact, for example, for, uh, if I remember correctly, for women uh, during, you know, when they were pregnant, they had specific accelerometers on their bellies. Other women had accelerometers on their arms, different accelerometers, right. different different yeah. ways of measuring. And you're like, 
How yeah, we do so, I mean, <laughs> which reminds me, this is a favorite study. This was like a decade ago, and they wanted to look at physical activity in kids because adolescent obesity is a real problem. They gave these kids these accelerometers, and they got the data back. You probably you might know the paper we're talking about, and they're like, "This data is impossible." And the kids that put them on their dogs. <laughs> People cheat. It's just the nature of the beast. So I'm like, so another way they'll do it is, you know, there's a paper I'm going to talk about. I'm getting towards the end. They put them in a closed room that uses like motion detectors or lasers or something. And like, but is that ecological to the real world? And the answer is no, because in that particular paper that I'll come to, the, the data they got out of the room contradicted the data they got out of the free living state because you're, because con- now the constraint is, you're in a room. Yeah. Right? <laughs> now, now the constraint is you don't have to walk to go to the ground. Like, you're in a bigger so, room. <laughs> so we run into real problems about measuring this. You can, you can lock them down in the lab, which may give you control, but no ecological validity. You can try to send them out in the real world and God knows what's going to happen. I mean, uh, this is a too much information story. So in the 2000s, we had the body bug. If you remember that one, that was one of the very early versions and it had an accelerometer, it had like temperature, inductance, and it measured mm-hmm. movement, right? And one of the things they found early on is that it didn't measure cycling because it was upper body only. And you wore it on the left arm. Man, should I tell this story? Yeah, I'm gonna tell the story. So I had um, some personal time. And I was using my left hand. <laughs> <laughs> told me I burned like 600 calories. I'm like, damn, I wish. So these things, are you there? You froze. Yeah, there's my way too much information story, but it makes the point. Of, the, the, the same thing happened with kids when they, they did that. Thinking? Well, yeah, but like, what are, what are they, what are these things actually? But again, I, I hate, like, it's very easy to go, oh, dismiss the technology. This is the technology we have. When we get better technology, hopefully we can get better answers on this. But to make yeah. this circular argument of, we gave them hopefully a fixed amount of activity that maybe maybe they did if it was actually supervised and they didn't achieve a calculated amount of body fat loss or body weight loss that we predicted based on calculations, then we're going to merely assume what the mechanism was when we've got a lot, a lot of unmeasured data points on here. And again, I'm not dismissing this so much saying the assumptions that are being made, it's almost like starting from the conclusion and working backwards. Well, we expected this weight loss. They didn't get it. The, ergo, we're going to assume what the mechanism is based around personal bias. And then you get to look at the data and go, the data doesn't, not only doesn't support it, but it almost contradicts it when you actually start or again, long-term body weight, whatever. Okay, so there's a paper, and again, so what you would have to do, get an accurate measure of total daily energy expenditure, which is very difficult. I guess doubly labeled water would be the best you could do, and that's expensive and gross. I don't know, I'm not, I'm, I've never looked into it in detail. You would have to do a controlled exercise intervention, mm-hmm. being supervised, you have to know exactly, like, that can be done, that has been done in studies. Yeah. Food intake is always tough, because you either rely on food records, which are terrible and should never be trusted. You can give them all their food, which is prohibitively expensive over more than a couple of weeks, unless you're Kevin Hall and gets all the money in the world for funding. I don't know. I mean, I guess he got it from New Sci for that one paper, but even two weeks of that. But then how do you measure needs? Uh, yeah. Now, we might, get to the point. we might get to the point. Years ago, I had this belief. We'll see it. We'll get there. We're, we're going to have, <laughs> I shouldn't even say this. They're going to make microchips that go in our bloodstream. Maybe we're all getting, maybe we're already getting them. I'm kidding people. Stop. Don't jump down my throat about that. Totally kidding. But we're going to get these little biochips that are going to be able to measure blood glucose, Real amino time. acid levels, nutrient level, hormone levels rapidly. And then once a month, we're all going to go to the, the state sponsored uh, data center, and they're going to scan the, the barcode on the back of our neck, and we're going to get the most immense data set that's ever been had in the history of the world, because we're going to have every human being in the world generating actually measured data that can yeah. then be cross-correlated with everything. 
it'll happen. Maybe not in my lifetime, but this is the future that I, and we're getting there. We're getting good biometers. We've got stuff that can measure blood glucose real time through the skin. We're getting there. Maybe we'll have the technology to get accurate measurements of NEAT at some point in the future. Maybe we can find a way to have people, I mean, people take pictures of their food already. Maybe that's the way you do an actual food record. I don't know, but those things are shit. Um, the, the, so we've got a lot of data that we're missing. So do I think something absolutely? Yeah, and again, real world, you know, like I said, yeah. to your point, Sumi's thing, you have found that there's a sweet spot. There's an amount of activity you can do before which you feel this big, and you, you can feel it. You've done, you know, you do those workouts and you come out going, I'm going to go lay down for two or three hours. And then you do the workouts that are 10% less and you come out and you're fine and you either, or you're energized or whatever. Like I said, in a lot of the work shows that actually when you get people to start exercising, their need goes up initially. Yeah. And when it goes down, it's because their weight has dropped. So what's the problem? Okay. So this brings us to a paper that everyone in the fitness space jumped on. It was, there were like 84 authors on. No, no, I'm sorry. There's the first, there's a 2021 paper by Ponser and the rest of the world. It's one of those of like 80 called Daily Energy Expenditure Through the Human Life Course. And he looked at energy expenditure over from kids to older folks. And what they found was that number one, total daily energy expenditure increased with fat-free mass. Right? They looked at 6,400 people and they took data on kids and, and babies and stuff to add to it. Then they adjust, they did a bunch of mathematical adjustments. And what they found, which was fine, they were, they adjusted the data for body size, also sex and age. And what they called, they called it residuals. 100% meant that, that the predicted, the energy expenditure is predicted for weight and fat free mass and fat mass was what it should be versus mm -hmm. higher or lower. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that neonates, size adjusted energy expenditure was similar to adults, right? Little babies, right? Just post birth. From one to 20 years old, it was much, much higher, 147% compared to adults of what you would predict. Well, that's the cost of growth, right? And then that's, that's the rapid growth period where we know that, I mean, that's inventing the wheel. Little, little, well, but it was, this was just trying to present the data and go, okay, let's look at, and so what you see is it goes here, and then there's this huge ramp from one to 20, and then from 20 to 60 years, total and basic energy expenditure was stable, meaning it wasn't really changing, but they said that they also saw that fat-free mass and fat mass didn't change from age 20 to 60. Uh, what? Would you like to know how much I believe that? The massive, massive jump said, from said, 20 to 30. No, this, was the like, this was the measurement. Like they had the data. However, neither fat mass nor percentage of body fat increased in this period, which is the consistent with the hypothesis that energy intake is coupled. We know that as people get older, that they lose muscle, especially as they hit, maybe not from 20 to 30, but as we get up, we, then they found maybe, there was a break what is it, point. 30, of, 37 onwards? Something like that, if they're not active. There's a break point at 63 years old where there was a decline in energy expenditure as along with fat-free mass and then fat mass. And then above 90, they were 26 below predicted because again, at that point, your organs literally are shutting down. Like they are burning less calories per unit mass. And then they calculated organ-specific energy expenditure, uh, blah, blah, whatever. Observed basal expenditure exceeded organ-based essence by 30% from one to 20. So again, organs are, it's just growth. 20% lower over 60 years, indicating that. So anyway, that's fine. And everyone jumped on this. The thing was, what if, and it was like, see, metabolic rate doesn't go down as you get older. It doesn't when you adjust it for fat-free mass. If you maintain, but that is a big ass assumption. And regardless of their data, I think it fails a reality check. Do some people do it? Yeah, if you, I mean, masters athletes maintain most of it, but in the average population, but because the way the fitness professionals were presenting it was, see, you don't have an excuse for not losing more weight, losing weight when you're older. Like y'all should read past the abstract, read the actual full paper guys. Of course, we also know basal metabolic rate has never been the issue. 
right? This has been, this is a 30, 40 year old thing that still kicks around. Oh, you've got a low best metabolic rate. No, you don't. You've got low needs. That is the variation. And this didn't look at activity. Yes, but it fails at what we said before, regardless the when you say yeah. from 20 to 60, and then you're going back and trying to bring people that are actually athletes, like they're actually training. Yeah. What are you expecting? Right. But so I don't, I mean, whatever, everybody jumped on this in the fitness space, lots of Instagram memes. And it's like, y'all didn't really, yeah. It, here's a good example. If women burn, have a lower basal metabolic rate than men, because they're smaller. Yeah. Now, if you, if you normalize that to fat-free mass, it's basically the same. There's a little, there can, some studies find it's a little lower, some it's a little higher, depends on the phase, the menstrual cycle, blah, 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 blah. Okay, great. To say that it's the same, if you divide by fat-free mass, doesn't change the fact that it's lower in it's absolute not, terms. In three or four papers before, it was the same uh, thing. Yeah, I mean, it's like, yes, if you divide by fat-free mass, if you normalize it, of course, the muscle tissue of a 50-year-old burns the same as a muscle tissue, and a heart burns the same whether you're 50 or 20, and people don't generally maintain fat-free mass and not gain body fat from 20 to 50, and I don't know what this data where they, yeah, again, when you look at this data, right, they've got a cloud, and they draw a line through it and go, it's flat, and I'm like, Statistics. Anyway, all right. So then there was the next favorite paper. Karovi, 84 authors, and Ponzer was one of them. It's called Energy Compensation and Adiposity in Humans, Current Biology. Is that the 2021 that came out? Yeah, this is like six weeks ago, and this made yeah. me want to scream. So they took a data set of 1,754 people, some nuclear is weird, the data where they pulled it from, and they were like, it's from the nuclear coalition, some data set they had. And what they did is they graphed out total energy expenditure versus baseline energy expenditure. And they were, it was a calculation in the first place. And they did a regression, which meant they regressed total versus basal. Through all this data in the map, and what they found based on zero direct measurement, right? This was just like calculated numbers that the higher the activity level, the lower basal metabolic rate. Now, what it suggested, they suggested in the lean individuals, that as activity went up, there could be a 28% reduction in basal energy expenditure. And in the obese, it could be up to 50%. And I saw this and went, you have got to be kidding me. Because we talked about I've, that. Read, I've read a lot of stuff. I've read a lot of studies. I've read a lot of studies. I read a lot of metabolic. I've read, I've got like 26 review papers on metabolic adaptation. I've read them all multiple times. These numbers have never been seen in the history of ever. You told me about uh, drop in basal metabolic rate has <laughs> never been seen. Okay, so the, the best data point we have is the Minnesota starvation study. 20, 20, they saw there was a 40% total drop in basal metabolic rate. However, 25% of that was because they lost 25% of their body weight. There's additional 15% from an adaptive decrease. They were at 4% body fat, and it was still not this level. Obese individuals for BMR, let's say you've got someone who weighs 200 pounds at 30% body fat, their basal metabolic rate is about 1,600 calories. You're saying that as they exercise, their basal metabolic rate will drop to 800? And I saw this, and I won't name him, when C, C, aerobic activity causes a drop in benefit, but weight training doesn't cause this. Okay, number one, they've never studied this with regards to weight training. They've never looked at compensation. This guy is an anti-cardio ideologist. He is a statistician. He only reads titles and abstracts and only presents the day. You know who I'm talking about, and I'm going to be nice, not name him. But he presented this one on Instagram as C, C. The paper looked at no direct data. They didn't look at a single direct measurement of basal metabolic rate to know that this data was bullshit. It has never been seen in any study ever. Even has with it, hypothyroid, you won't see a drop in basal metabolic rate of 50%. Has the Minnesota uh, been duplicated, I think? They did it. They did a shorter version of it. They did a three-week Minnesota, which it was wasn't 20, really long enough. And yeah. it was 22 23% again, the 
It'd be mm-hmm. great to see it. I would love them to. I mean, they'll yeah. never get past ethics. I would love to see it with modern technology because so much of that, I think we get so much better data. All right. So about three weeks later, paper came out by Halsey L called The Mystery of Energy Compensation, Physiological and Biochemical Zoology. Now, he and several of the authors, dude, I, you know me, I read everything. He and several of the authors were on that previous paper. Oh. Okay. Now. Makes sense. He says, so they look at all this, and what he was asking, the question of their paper was, where is the, any, where is the compensation occurring? Something seems to be go on, going on, but where is it? The question we've been asking for the last six hours. So first he talks about the data on NEAT. So it says the data is conflicting and it's often estimated. To your point, we're going, we're going, this is what we expected. It's not what happened, ergo. You write, first, the energy of costs of NEAT are a strong predictor of daily energy expenditure and very widely between people. Second, this variation may in part be explained by market individual differences in NEAT-driven compensatory responses and the fact that few studies thus far have measured NEAT directly. Third, shorter exercise sessions may influence NEAT less than longer sessions, while decreases in NEAT may attenuate through the exercise period as you get fitter. So basically it's going, could be in NEAT, the data doesn't really support it, we haven't seen it, it might go up, so we're going to throw that one out. Then you talk about decreases in basal metabolic rate which occur with weight loss. Interventions that increase activity levels often lead to changes in body composition, such as weight loss and increased levels of fat-free mass, which in turn affect basal metabolic rates, making it difficult to justify explaining energy compensation in response to increased activity as being due to a decrease in BMR. The decrease in BMR is due to the change in body composition. Here we go again. Oh no, it gets even better. In most studies where participants exhibited no change or only a marginal decrease in body mass, in, res- in response to an increase in daily activity levels, they exhibited no change in BMR, measured. In a few studies where participants experienced no change in body mass, they exhibited a small increase in BMR. <laughs> What's your Same guy is on the paper from three weeks ago. <laughs> Same guy. It gets better. Two papers report a decrease in BMR despite little to no change in body weight. One was Westerterp, the marathon study, 40 calories against tiny. Wow. Silva, which I guess I didn't look up, but the decrease is modest and would count for only a small proportion of the observed energy compensation. Small, 50, I think I saw 100. Meta-analysis by Mackenzie Shalders 2020 that focused on studies of healthy non-elderly participants, although typically overweight, found the papers reporting a stable body mass during experimental intervention also reported an increase in resting metabolic rate. <clears throat> Overall, then, the interpretation of exercise interventions in the animal literature across birds and mammals indicates that reductions in BMR to decreased activity are modest at best when body mass remains constant. So basically, what he just wrote says, you know that paper we published three weeks ago? But then, oh, this is so good. This is so good. Summary. Synthesizing the findings of various papers cited above does not return a clear conclusion about the importance of BMR and energy compensation in response to activity increases. The results of a field survey for humans and field surveys of other animals, the paper they wrote before, where variations in activity are not usually determined by prescribed exercise regimes, suggests that BMR down regulation could be a substantial, perhaps the substantial element. So he's saying the direct studies don't ever show it, but this field study where we calculated a bunch of crap out and did graphs. Energy compensation. In contrast, lab-based exercise intervention indicate a limited role, if any, of BMR. For humans specifically, lab-based studies indicate an unclear role for needs. The reduction in need is recorded, can rarely account for a substantial proportion of the observed energy compensation. In contrast, the few experiences of need in animals, all in mice, provide, cl- who, I don't give a shit about mice. Um, so he, he, looking at the, <laughs> just love this, I find very limited evidence in the human literature of a BMR decrease in response to a chronic period and increased activity. In most studies where participants exhibited no change or only a marginal decrease in body mass, they also exhibited no change in BMR. In a few studies where participants exhibited, experienced no change in body mass, they exhibited a small increase in BMR. Two peepers reported decrease in BMR despite little and no increase. Um, so basically, what he's saying is that the direct study says that our previous paper, it, this is, you know what this reminds me of? 
this is like keto zealots. And you go, look, yeah. the re like the uncontrolled studies show epidemiology shows this, but the direct studies show this and they go, well, the epidemiology epidemiology is more accurate. What he's saying is, well, our field study where we did a bunch of math and graphs suggested that BMR goes by down by 28 to 50%. And yet no study has ever shown this ever in the history of ever. And you know what's even funnier? The people that jumped on the study suggesting activity, to, they didn't seem to report on this new one because it didn't meet their... So then he finally... Yeah, asked, very picking. Well, so he does, he does look at athlete data. There's a transcontinental race. We're talking RAM. We're talking the race across America. We're talking ultra endurance insanity. They were running five hours a day and their meat came down by 600. Yeah, I can believe that. But they were probably burning 2,000. They were running five hours a day. That would make me tired hmm. too. Lyle, you used to do that. You used to run... You used to do I didn't run. Sport. I rode bikes and skated. Yeah, yeah. that will make you tired. No, no, I mean, you and used they, to they, they, endurance, right? That's heavy. I mean, yeah, we're talking yeah. about long duration ultra endurance training. Yeah. Would you, would you want to increase your need after that? No, you want to go because they got to do it again the next day. Yeah, you want to go lie down. 18 hours and then sleep an hour and go ride some more. So he then also, he says again, overall then these studies considered in detail suggest that BMR is at best a minor element. Neat is a more promising explanation, but is yet to be adequately measured. And he says, what other components? His BMR might play a role due to some complicated measurement oddity. It's like there might be a change in mitochondrial efficiency or UCP. Like at this point, we are just grasping Throwing everything in. We are just guessing. I mean, make, make no mistake. He was saying, I'm speculating. Now this, I bring this up because this is funny. For a while, there's been this thing about how, oh, you get more efficient with aerobic activity and you burn less calories because people don't understand what exercise efficiency is. So it's a 2010 study by Burgess and Lambert. They report that the evidence for increased running efficiency in response to exercise training is mixed. When present, modest, at 3% energy savings, although greater at lower speeds. They reported, Tremblay reports a 12%, 7%, and 3% energy saving when walking at four and a half, five and a half, and 6.5 kilometers per hour after 93 days of training. So if you're burning 100 calories before, you'll be burning 97 because you get a 3% decrease. That's efficiency. And maybe a little, and, and you'll get a 12% at 4.5 4 kilometers per hour. That's like two miles an hour. That's not walking. That's well, barely walking. They should watch their program. And then they're like, maybe there's a reduction in stress hormone or stuff. Like at this point, you're just like, look, the calories are missing. We don't know where they are. Maybe there's problems in our assumptions. Maybe the problem is we're assuming this is the weight loss and that there must be a compensation because they're not meeting it. Maybe the calculation's wrong. And finally, let's see, there was one last thing and I'm done reading stuff at people. Um, oh, this was from an early, it says results from the available literature in the current trial. This was the, the non-responder paper. Oh, yeah. Individuals who fail to lose weight show higher levels of energy intake and reduced non-exercise, exercise, non-N-E-E-X, non-exercise expenditure, maybe. These observations suggest that behavioral counseling in conjunction with an exercise intervention to minimize or eliminate these compensatory changes may improve exercise-induced weight loss. The ultimate goal will be identify baseline characteristics of participants who are likely to be non-responsive for weight loss. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, great. Because again, okay, let's, let's look at athletes. Let's look at physique dieters. Let's look at people who are consciously attentive to all these variables. They lose fat just fine. And you can pretty much predict it pretty damn well. When you start looking at gen pop, who are unconsciously, and like I said, if it's unsupervised exercise, it's crap. Nobody's working as hard as they think, or they're skipping workouts, or they're lying, they're misreporting it. Sorry, lying is too strong of a word. Misreporting it, you got to supervise <laughs> it, got to make the intensities enough, you got to ramp it up. Also, most, most exercise interventions use microscopic, like we had 30 minutes at 75% for 12 weeks. They never increase it. There is no progressive overload. There, it's like, that's why the, the Wisconsin study or whatever it was, they're like, we went six months, we ramped it up, we supervised it. We made sure they burned X amount of calories and everybody lost fat because of course they did. Did they lose exactly the number predicted? No, but- well, That's the thing, it's the, but yeah. they did. 
the individuality of things, right? And that's the, the, the main problem of lacking of true evidence on all this bullshit of, you know, uh, the more we cr increase physical activity, the more adaptation we have. And I, I, that's why I, I, I send you the email. I was like, I'm not buying it. Yeah, like I said, I think there's certainly... And we haven't even so checked the, the, the either neurochemical or biochemical um, data on anyone. And I think that would be much, much harder to measure, but in the, the only stuff, you know, they, the only, they, have, they have occasionally looked at leptin because that's at least easy to measure. Measuring neurochemistry, neurochemicals is real, real, real hard because you need a big needle and a bottle of vodka and a real, you need real trusting subjects. They do it in, in animals, but animal models almost never translate. And I just don't even pay much attention to them anymore. So I, I can remember one specific study and they had women and men exercise for a week at energy balance. And what they found was that leptin was unchanged in the men and it actually did go down in the women a little bit. And there is certainly evidence that women may adapt faster and or harder for evolutionary biological reasons. But even that, you know, some of the studies, it's like, look, we saw the adaptation of the men and not the women. So we're trying to mix this data set from a bunch of assumptions with a bunch of unmeasured variables with a, a response that may be 50%, 100% in either direction. So the one data, what, what did I say it was like, the range was like negative 150%. They burned more than predicted to 100% compensation. You look at the individual data and there's data way back, right? You give somebody like an exercise study and like, here's no weight loss. Like half of them are here and half of them gain weight. And then you, and that's why you do these studies are like, there was a zero weight loss. No, a bunch of people lost a ton of weight and some people lost, gained weight and because they're probably eating more or who knows, but usually that's what it is. They've, they've done that work. They have done it in free feeding and they're like, all right, we had them exercise and then gave them access to a buffet, which yeah. sign me up for that study, the free food buffet. I'm all about that. And some people have an increase in appetite, hormonal, psychological, neurochemical, physiological, who the hell knows? Then again, there's another researcher who wrote, a bunch, I forget his name, he wrote one of the best papers I ever read. He noted that people eat about three times as much at those free buffets and studies as they do under normal conditions. Those aren't ecological to the real world because if I said, go eat all this good food for free, I'm gonna eat three times as much as I want. So even that's not particularly valid as a measurement. And the problem is it's easy to dismiss all this because it's just hard to measure. The constraint and, energy expenditure model? Well, I mean, yeah, like I said, I mean, I can see, I think there is something to it. I think as it's being presented is very problematic. I certainly think as Ponser is presenting it and I don't, like I said, when I read the papers and go dig up the individual studies and go, you know what, if three out of four in postmenopausal women, I don't think this is very, now, is it generalizable to postmenopausal women? Sure. Is it generalizable to the entirety of the world? No. And then a fourth paper you cite did a half marathon and the drop in sleeping metabolic rate was one tenth of the actual increase. That doesn't impress me much. Plus, let's not forget that we don't have enough data from all women, like different cultures. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Which also, that could be, uh, we, we're not yeah, actually giving the evidence we need. Uh, yeah, I think we need those very direct measurements. I think we're making a lot of assumptions, possibly circular assumptions. And again, when you look at the proposed mechanisms, well, meat goes down, but what little data has been done doesn't really show that. Not, not, not when it's measured, it's when we guess at it, because <laughs> we've got no other explanation. The idea that BMR drops is clearly wrong. The data shows that it's either no change or goes up if weight is maintained. And again, if you want to say that, well, the constraints to increased exercise is decreased body fat, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> that seems to counter how this is being presented. Now, yeah, maybe would more activity necessarily lead to a more rapid decrease in body fat? 
maybe, maybe not. But well, you put that in, in, in your book when you were saying actually that a woman uh, after finishing a you know her training can actually have like a 10 to 15 minute high intensity session at the end when you were talking about reesterification and all that. I can see right. that, but we cannot say that this is not going to work in the aspect of the more I train, the, the less I'm going to Yeah, but even that, you know, energy expenditures. Yeah, and even with that, it's just like, you know, what he's saying is that, well, up to, after you exceed a certain point of activity, the body will constrain with adaptations in need or BMR. And it's like, well, maybe, but maybe we're just making assumptions about calculated values without direct measurements we need. And I'm not saying he's necessarily wrong. What I'm saying is that, I think his model is very speculative. In many cases, the data he writes doesn't support it or says the exact opposite. How would you want it to be stated that, then? What would you prefer as a statement? It's a really good question. I mean, by the time you qualify it that much, you know, at, at best, I think what the data says is that in response to exercise, there will some people will show a decreased response, possibly due to an adaptation in NEAT and or an increase in food intake, which is just saying that <laughs> we need to educate them. But it doesn't say anything. It really doesn't say anything new. Yeah. And all that means that we have to tell, you know, because again, I wrote an article years ago about this and you know, it was like, someone I know, um, Somebody called them, their gym, and was like, how much exercise do I need to do to burn off a bag of M&Ms? And they told them, the person got angry at them for, I'm like, why? They didn't make you beat the bag. Of, it's very strange because they got very upset because realizing that that 500 calories, you're gonna have to do an hour of hard activity. And what I pointed out, we've known for the longest time that exercise A doesn't really do a whole lot for weight loss in the amounts it's typically given because they're very small, doesn't burn a lot of calories compared to how much you can, can decrease um you know food intake where was i going with this what were we talking about i know we're seriously going um <laughs> oh you yeah but it's just this it's sort of the idea that's like look you know well there's a sort of that psychological it's the ah uh, people have this idea about how many calories they're burning during exercise which is frequently skewed I wrote a piece, a really pissy piece a couple of years ago. And I was just like, dumb shit fitness professionals say, stop pe telling people to do their own research. Well, stop telling people to stop eating like an asshole. That's not the problem. Yeah, yeah, that was- like, orange, theory, orange theory is telling people you're burning a thousand calories an hour in activity. It's like, nah, it's more like 350. And people fall into the, I don't have to worry about what I eat. I can eat more food because I'm they've been- Oh, so I guess my thing would be, well, you just need to educate our clients and go, look, if you're increasing activity, you need to be sure that your other daily activity doesn't go down. I think there's even, and I've seen this Levine, who of course is the neat guy, really firmly believes, I think there's something to this, that increasing neat is probably a better way in the big picture to increase total daily energy expenditure. Because in, in, you know, for the reason that you can burn almost as many calories as formal exercise, if you do it for long enough, yeah. right? Let's say you can increase the by one calorie a minute, 60 calories an hour, 480 calories over an eight hour work day. That's an hour of pretty hard cardio without thinking about it. And sort of by definition, increasing meat can't decrease needs. So yeah, we may be looking at, yeah, maybe when you add 300 calories of too hard formal exercise to someone who's untrained and they get tired, maybe that's, but that's not, an, that's not the activity per se as I see it, not the way it's being presented. That's, you know, and maybe people wear like, you, know, you can't, you can't out train a bad diet. Now I've got I mean, people on Facebook, including a good friend of mine who's like, yeah, you can. I go, dude, you're a high performance athlete training five hours a day. Yes, you can. You can out train a bad diet. You can out train a bad diet. Most people cannot, right? My favorite, that, that was the miss about being an endurance athlete. Dude, you can eat everything. 
It's awesome. There's a paper by Louise Burke, a case study on this Australian cyclist who got hurt and he was bringing her back and she was trying to diet her, bring her performance back and keeping energy availability high enough. And at one point she was doing two five hour bike rides a week. And on the five hour bike ride a day, she was eating like 3,500 calories and was in like a 750 calorie per day deficit. Oh, endurance training is so awesome because you can eat it. So yeah, elite athletes can out train a bad diet. You can't. You can't with an hour of faffing about in the gym. That's, so, that's, so I think it's not it. so much that activity, increasing amounts of activity per se automatically cause this because clearly it doesn't in many studies doing, more, you know, e- even in the marathon study. Yeah. By week 40, as volume went up, they, they stopped, but they were eating more. Their appetite started to go up and they'd all lost body fat. So why is that? Why are we pretending that, Ponzer doesn't seem to be taking that into account, that a lot of these constraints are because the person is lighter. Isn't that the point? Um, So yeah, I think it needs to be presented in a much more nuanced way that yes, there are things that, and it's absolutely not in BMR. It's not. I think that we can, and, and throwing out ideas that there may be changes in mitochondrial function or uncoupling proteins or the electron transport chain. Dude, just stop. Like seriously, just, just please, just please stop. Um, just because that's almost, at that point we're getting into metaphysics. What we're saying is, well, we're measuring BMR. And even though we're not measuring a change, there's a change. Because well, even one of the papers, this was sort of the argument that they made. They were like, well, we only measure BMR at one time point. Maybe if you're exercising in the afternoon for the couple of hours, maybe there's this time point later in the day, and that's where the 24-hour decrease in BMR is occurring. And I'm like, except if you look at the epoch data, which is microscopic to begin with, bad news. It's the opposite. And that so was a fiasco. Well, it? yeah, that, but, it, but the point of this being that now we're basically making up physiology based on speculation because we'll, since we can't explain it, since we don't have an answer, well, maybe we'll just make something up. Dude, you should be in the online fitness industry because now physiological rationale is evidence where you can just make make it up as you go along and as long as it's sound. I'm like, may, maybe so, but until you measure that, don't just guess. And that's all they were doing. So BMR doesn't seem to be it. NEAT could be it under specific conditions. Mm-hmm. But even that seems to be highly variable depending how long it is. So papers go, yeah, 20 weeks, you don't really see a compensation. Well, week 20, you're smaller and maybe you're tireder or maybe you're fitter and it goes up. Or maybe when you're looking at variability between individuals that is literally a hundredfold, that literally can vary from negative 75 to hundred percent. Maybe we need to, maybe, maybe we need to look at who are their non-responders rather than the group as a whole. Because when you average a bunch of, when you average a cloud together, you get zero and that belies yeah, and make no mistake, I don't even looked into it. Some people seem to be generally spontaneously more active. That's yeah. true. And it's weird. Maybe I should email Ponser because he clearly hasn't read this data. It is in the dopamine system. I've seen it. And they're like, yes, people with a certain the way they they enjoy exercise more, they seem to show higher spontaneous levels of meat. There is something going on there neurochemically. Maybe in obesity, there's a down regulation of that. But for that one paper to go, yeah, we predict that obese people will show a greater decrease in basal metabolic rate, a value that's never, ever been seen ever. But we're not going to bother looking at any actual measurement data. So Polsky was saying that actually for uh, people with specific disorders, that they were like this because of their dopamine being hyperactive and all that kind of uh, malarkey. Uh, and it's been out there for ages and ages ago. Um, also in the book, I think, was it exercised? Um, again, I read that. Again. Yeah, I didn't read that one either. What was Sapolsky saying exactly? I don't remember that. So if I remember correctly, it was on people uh, with uh, specific disorders um, mm. that because that they were hyperactive, I don't know if it was in uh, mm. schizophrenia or something like that, 
they were saying it was uh, due to uh, increase in dopamine. Oh yeah, yeah, and there, I, I mean, there's even an oddity. There is a subtype of anorexia where mm -hmm. they are hyperactive, yeah, which seems very contradictory to the dietary data. But there, you're looking at severe, severe neurochemical dysfunction and a lot of things, you know. And you could even argue that well, their activity goes up to maybe help them go find food. Like there is a certain logic to that. There's, you know, there can be a weird euphoria. I know people that, and you, I had a good friend who came from an eating disorder background, man, she's great at dieting because she, she enjoys it. She, she enjoys the suffering, the hunger. She embraces the hunger, which you kind of have to do like, and that come, that was part of what led her down that path is, you know, there was also stuff with, you know, exercise addiction and also dieting, frequently exercise reduce anxiety. So if exercise addicts, if they've got severe, when they exercise, their anxiety improves for a little bit. And when you diet and screw up your mess with your neurochemistry, anxiety comes down. So it becomes a very feed for cycle. You're like, oh, the less I eat, the better. I mean, you physically feel mm -hmm. better. So there's all kinds of weirdness. So, so yeah, there's probably, and that maybe that explains the responders versus the non-responders. Honestly, getting way off topic, for like two decades now, they've been like, look, if the thrifty gene hypothesis were true, yeah, everybody should be obese. And Speakman has written, he's written a bunch of good stuff about why that model is probably not right. There's probably some other things going on. Um, but the question has always been, we are in an obesogenic environment. Now, ignoring the people, the fitness neurotics, who consciously clamp down there, there is a proportion of people that stay spontaneously thin and avoid obesity in the modern environment. Right? I'm not talking about training people who just, yeah, yeah. we know them, we hate them uh, because they don't have to work at it. And for two decades, it's been like, okay, maybe rather than studying what's dysfunctional in the obese, Let's figure out what the hell's going on right in them. I hate to use the word right because that, sorry, poor choice of words. I live in the U.S. and still real sensitive to all that crap in the sense of what is going on physiologically under the hood in terms of appetite suppression, in terms of upregulating meat, in terms of whatever is going on. What can we learn from that to try to apply to obesity treatment? Can we figure out what's going on there and mimic that? And actually, I think we're getting closer We've got, you know, with new obesity drugs, we've mm. got, you know, people that have a hyperactive dopamine and or endocapenoid system. We're using Contrave or whatever that one is that, that hits basically bupropion and an opioid antagonist, whatever the hell it is. Um, you know, we've now got a Zempic that is showing phenomenal effects working in glucagon like peptide one. Like what is good, but what, but, to me, that's almost the more, that, that is as interesting of a question is, okay, there are non-responders to exercise interventions. We can take that as a given. We know that's the case. Even if we can't say why. Could be increased food intake. I think it frequently is. Maybe there are compensations in NEAT. Maybe. Maybe. Are there are compensations in BMR. Absolutely not. Honestly, we can throw that one out as far as I'm concerned. The data, what direct data has been done shows at most, the Western Terp study, again, they were losing weight. You can't even separate the two. Because again, not even the same thing. And it wasn't even a drop in the sleeping metabolic rate till week 20. And they'd lost, you know, five pounds of body fat, of course. So I don't think you can even necessarily say that was the activity per se, except in as much as the exercise caused them to lose fat, which is the goal the point of this exercise, but let's look at the responders versus the non-responders measure, but we need that data too. We need, all right, we took them, the BMR, hopefully controlled food intake in some meaningful way better than tell us what you ate. People always say, even in fitness, like muscle growth studies, both groups always say they ate the same amount without exception, without exception. And yet one group lost weight. I got news for you. No, you didn't. I don't, this data, I don't believe for a second. It's crap. It's the best we've got, but it doesn't change the fact that it's crap. So you need that. You need a decent way of measuring needs. You need to make sure the, okay, great. We've got all that data. Now let's look at 
who are the responders, who are the non-responders, what's the difference? Now we can start parsing this out. Is it behavioral? Is it physiological? Not that there's a difference between the two. What, you know, like I said, at this point, we're doing a tremendously expensive study. And I, it, we also are getting into the point of, is the mechanism, it's always interesting from a scientific standpoint. It's always good to know, but mechanistically does that change? What can we draw from that in an application sense? Okay, great. We know that some people were, do, right? Do I need to know this? Do I need to know that someone has compensated in the past? Or can I simply make sure and educate them early on? Look, when you do this, you need to make sure that the rest of your daily, and it's a lot easier now, right? Like even any phone will do a rough step count. It yeah. won't be, will it be perfect? No, but it's at least data. One of the really interesting things I saw with the body bug, even though you had to pay for a monthly subscription to access the data on the website, it sucked. Whatever, they had to make their money. You can only sell the body bug once. Is people, first off, having the data gave you feedback. To let you yeah. know what was, and that's key. You got to know. That's why. You got a starting point. Sure, that's why. You know, yes, they can make you go neurotic, but all the stuff where people log their food and log, like having the data, is the first step. What's what's the old trite saying? If you're not assessing, you're guessing. Okay, but it's true. You do like you got to have some data. But what started to happen is people. This is early gamifying. People would go, "Oh, I want to beat that." They wanted it because they wanted to see the chart go up. And totally different topic. Gamification is the future of all of this without, yeah. for gen pop. Athletes, the gamification is being pretentious, is being able to put up pictures on Instagram and have people feed your narcissism. That's the game of, it's how many likes can you get? That's the gamification for fit pros and how many video, how many YouTube views you can get. But for the general population, having that data, even if it's just basic step counts, to go, all right, and I'm sure you've done this. If I weren't such a Luddite, I would have this data too, but I don't care. I know what my step count is, <laughs> and it's not high. I know I sit on my butt all day. I don't need those numbers to depress me. But, <laughs> you know, get that data and go, okay, look, today you did this moderate amount. You know, you did 30, 45 minutes of moderate intensity cardio. Step count was this. All right, well, Friday you went and decided I'm going to do jump on the interval train and your step count dropped by half. Well, what did you learn? A, the interval workout actually burned less calories. I got bad news for you. The interval workout burned less calories than the cardio. But EPOC, no, 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 no. But not, no. You still don't burn as many. But what you learned is that almost that the interval training did more harm than good. Or if nothing else, it canceled itself out. Right? Yeah. 45 minutes of moderate cardio, you burn 400 calories with no change in step count. That added 400 calories. The interval workout, you did 300 and your step count dropped by 100 calories a day. It would be so different if you the step count and did that. Or, right, but if you maintain your step count, but even so, you, I mean, let's say you did the exact amount of activity. 400 calories of moderate activity exercise should not tire you out if you're fit. 400 calories of interval, interval training will leave you murdered if you did it right. Trust me, I had power meter data on so many workouts. I could do 600 calories in an hour at aerobic levels, but I mean, I was super fit, right? I, you know, at that point, 200 watts was aerobic level for me and it wouldn't affect me at all. And I would do a crushing 30 minute interval workout that would make, I would burn, generate half as many watts, half in terms of like my power meter measured total wattage, which you can calculate to calories. And I would be exhausted for the rest of the day. I bet. The, low, the moderate intensity, the aerobic cardio burn was way more, but again, I was super fit. I've been doing it for years and years and years. It didn't tire me out. So yeah, I think with that data, and just educating your clients. Look, you need to be aware, like your food and no matter what you think, you did not burn a thousand calories in that workout. If you're a smaller woman and you lifted weights for an hour, 300, maybe tops. tops. If you're a bigger guy, maybe 450. And that assumes you weren't spending 10 minutes on your phone between sets, which is what everybody at my gym does right now. They are in more of a hurry to get through their set and get back to their phone than they are to actually like. 
<laughs> I will finish my workout in the time that it takes most people to do like three sets because it's do a set Instagram for 10 minutes. I'm just like, okay, you're not burning anything. Um, so yeah, I think, I think more back to the question, will having the mechanistic data about what's exactly changing lead us to better practical solutions? Do you think so? Will it really change what we're telling people? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, yeah, people need to be aware that this can happen. And I will, I would always tell people, look, if you're, gonna, if you're a beginner and you're gonna lose the same amount on 300 versus 600 calories, and you very well might, you very well might not, then do the 300. But, I'm, I, but I've always been a believer. If you're a beginner, you shouldn't go in and crush yourself anyway, because that's just dumb. Right, you need to build up to that, and you will be super surprised where you are. And not to mention, you probably quit. Um, I remember there was one of the many, the previous guru circle jerk. This is circa late two thousands, and he would take beginners and first workout, give them like four sets of ten short rest period compound exercises. And I'm like, um. Are you worried about everybody quitting? And he said, yeah, they've already signed a check. Okay, I hate this industry some days, most days, but that was his attitude towards it. And they've already, they've already signed on for so I can do whatever I want. That's to me, not a very good approach, you know? And I do, when I consult people, I've written articles, I got this whole training, you know, article series. And it's like, look, and I tell them, early on exercise is not gonna do jack crap for your weight loss. You can't burn enough calories. The only people who can burn enough calories in exercise are high level athletes and they don't need the fat loss. It is it is an irony I've talked about for years. That's a confusion because people like just go to the gym too. Sure. When you're a lean cyclist, I could burn 600 calories an hour without even working. I was lean. I didn't really need to lose a whole lot of body fat. That's the beauty of it. And when you're an over fat beginner or just a beginner in general, and you can only burn five calories a minute and have low exercise tolerance, woohoo! That's why I still I see these articles: how to walk your walk the weight off. Not unless you're walking across the country. Um, you know, you can't that that five three calories a minute you're burning. It's not going to do a heck of a lot. Now, I'm like diet comes diet is first, but I'm like. Over six months, if you yeah. keep gradually building it and building it and building it in six months, when you're able to burn 450 right. calories in an hour, as you get lighter, then diet can play less of a role. Food intake can come back up. But, you know, whereas, and by that point, yeah, maybe there's a compensation, but you should be five kilos lighter after six months. Yeah, you've got to constrict, but at that point, you can do more. This was always, again, the same thing, the efficiency thing. People were like, oh, cardio is bad because you get more efficient and burn fewer calories. Well, A, the difference is microscopic. But B, have y'all forgotten about this little thing called progressive overload? Because it's, it's a kid, because these people were all pro weight training. And I would say, well, I have a question for you. If I'm lifting weights, well, eventually those weights get easier because I've adapted. <laughs> what do I do now? Like, it's the exact same argument. And they would go, well, you work harder. I wish I could do that during cardio. I wish there was some way. It's a shame that I'm locked at a low intensity of cardio and that I can't do more and or work at a higher intensity to offset this. Not that the effect is... <laughs> I've been in this industry too long and I'm old and I'm bitter and I've seen it all and it's all, it just, but that like, that was the late 2000s. We went from cardio got everybody ripped, which it did for 30 days. Suddenly, then it became cardio won't help you burn fat. Then it became cardio will make you fatter. There was that brief phase, all the intervals. And it's like, huh? So I guess three decades of guys getting and everybody got burnt out and all, and the arguments were just ridiculous. Um, I think Poliquin made one of my favorites. Well, they, one of, there were a couple of them. Well, you could be fat and run a marathon. You never see a fat sprinter. There is not, the general population runs marathons. You will never see an elite marathoner who's fat. 
You don't see, people don't run the 200 meter sprint recreationally. This is such a dumb example. But then Paul, yeah. Charles Poliquin in his, his genius, he would point out the same thing. We'll go to cardio classes and you'll see women with fat legs. You know what? I have never been in a weight room in my life where someone was lifting. I've never been in a weight room and seen anyone lifting who wasn't small and with high body fat ever. Everybody lifts weights, buff and lean without exception. Everybody, 100%. Paul was the worst. But yeah, that was one of his insane arguments. I go, yeah, you're right. But since Because cardio doesn't get everyone into shape and make everybody lean ergo because, you know, weight training makes everybody big and ripped except for every super heavyweight power lifter in the history of the sport, but Just whatever. The physiology books that you have me. Yeah, but, you know, he was the greatest coach in the world, according to himself. Um, that's a whole separate thing, and we're off topic. But, yeah, I think, like I said, we need better data. That better data will be interesting and in that it leads us, gives us an idea of mechanistically. What will it change, though, in terms of practical recommendations like i said poncer clearly there's something going on but we may just find out that it's just our assumptions it's because we're calculating how much fat again how do we explain the studies that found that they lost more fat than predicted huh now yeah it was 300 versus 600 maybe there is and but to your point there's a sweet spot if exercise makes you feel more energized which it does for many people yeah. You may be more active during the day or losing some body fat or just getting fitter. When you're fitter, it's easier to do life. Yeah. Whereas when you're less fit, it's harder. So getting fitter in the long term may actually increase meat. But again, we also still, the thing he's never, to my knowledge, taken into account. How do we separate this per se from the change in body mass? Because if energy expenditure becomes constrained because you're 10 kilos of body fat lower, I'd say that's okay. Yeah. And to yeah. ignore that is kind of silly. <laughs> Lyles, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. I know we kind of went around and around and around, but this is one that, because to your point, then I'll, we'll wrap up, it is getting represented in a way that is doing so much harm. I mean, yeah. I don't like this whole, for years, it's been the, the body fights back. Nobody loses weight successfully, but that's actually not true. That's absolutely, no. and what you're doing is you're programming people for failure. Now, no, yeah, I'm not no. saying you should program people and go, it'll be easy, but let's find a happy medium. If you've read an article that says nobody loses weight ever and the body adapts, which it does, and that's fine. It adapts when you've lost fat, because duh. And yeah, all you're doing is going, don't, bother try or if you're going to try just already accept that you're going to fail in which case i'd say then don't try and i would still maintain we should do one if you really want to hear me rant get me talking about intuitive eating oh my god you want to really hear me you want to really hear me rant right on our last oh, podcast on our last that? chat that was i said i said the one of the ones we need to do is intuitive uh, eating by far uh, yeah i wrote a really ranty I'm article anything with but what what i see happening i'm like yes if you diet and exercise in the incredibly stupid toxic way that people have done for decades yeah you're gonna fail and if you actually look at most of the intuitive dieting concepts that were developed in like 97 and have never been modified because that is also an ideology now yeah, yeah. what they are yeah, yeah, and i i agree with about half of what they say but what they are arguing against is not dieting. They're arguing against is rigid dieting and toxic dieting. But because they're an ideological cult, they have not updated anything on their website. They have not looked at the new data going, there are different kinds. Because they're all thinking like, don't bow to the diet police and good and yeah, I don't disagree, but we don't do that anymore not those of us that know what we're doing. We don't, we don't do that anymore. Dieting is not the problem. Bad dieting is the problem and all this other stuff. So yeah, that's, we can do that one later. Would you um, like a Christmas special on that? 
Yeah, I've been debating whether I want to run this article or not. <laughs> it's it was I was I did a bunch of super ranty videos about a year and a half ago, and I never did anything with them. One I should run because the fitness industry now runs anecdotes. Well, a certain group of fitness professionals has decided that their anecdotes count. Nobody else's anecdotes count somehow, but their anecdotes count now That's conveniently. Self. Um, they would never accept anyone else's, but theirs are now evidence. And I basically wrote a piece that was anecdotes or, sh your anec or just anecdotes for crap. It is not the height of the evidence pyramid. And <laughs> the plural of anecdotes is not science. But anyway, that's another thing for another day. So uh, I think the point is Ponce is probably on something. He needs to figure out the difference between exercise, weight loss, and body mass. Um, and he needs to cite data better. <laughs> he needs to not cherry pick data points from studies and leave out the important bits. But that's true of oh so many in this in this field. Well, thank you so much. We you, you promised for my uh, for my Christmas special. Uh, okay. I have pudding as well to do that for about intuitive eating. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, I'll give you a call uh, next week because we got a lot of things to talk about. Fantastic, Rocco. Have a good one. I'm glad you're feeling better. Have a good one. Thank you so much.